Good morning and have a beautiful new week, all of you online. Even though it's pretty white outside right now, at least here in Finland, the green shift is on the rise. Actually, ready on the way. And that offers great opportunities for the Nordic, Nordic countries. Event of today, Nordic Battery Belt, building the Scandinavian Silicon Valley of the battery industry, is bringing us together to discuss, share and hear information and what's going on. We have here over 100 registered participants from all over the Scandinavia. You all are warmly welcome. My name is Paula Erkila and I'm working as a CEO at Ostrobotnia Chamber of Commerce uh, on Finnish side of Kvarken and I will be your host today. Before I will give opening words to Christian Schrey, some introduction, some instruction how are we going to work. First, I remind you that the chat is open. So please feel free to comment, ask questions from our speakers. We will follow the discussions and might pick up some of those right after each presentation. It is also possible to have a couple of comments after each speaker. Second, don't forget the matchmaking, matchmaking sessions in the afternoon. Matchmaking is happening on B2Match platform and you will get more information and advice about that on the chat. Third, now Christian Schrey from VXPO, are you ready? We all are eager to hear some high profile opening words. Please, Christian. Well, thank you so much, uh, Paula, for that kind introduction. Uh, and good morning, everybody, on behalf of the whole VXPO and Nordic Hub team. I also want to welcome you to this event. I'm, of course, super excited about today's webinar and matchmaking session, and very glad to see that we have so many participants with us today. And let me also take this opportunity to thank our co-organizers of this event, the Quarken Council, Osterbotnia Chamber of Commerce, and Enterprise Europe Network. When we launched the Nordic Hub a while back, our main goal was to increase the cooperation between the Nordic countries on many levels. And of course, our core mission was to promote the Finnish exporting companies, but we have always believed that in order to deliver the solutions needed on the global market, you need to work together. This is why we are so happy organizing these Nordic events and matchmaking sessions that we of course hope will lead to new collaboration projects within the Nordics. And the trend we are seeing is that no matter what the industry you're working in, whether focus is on business to consumer or business to business, you need to find your role in the value chain of your ecosystem. And as we very well know, today's these value chains, clusters and ecosystems does not necessarily recognize any borders. We also see that ecosystems and clusters have a huge role in that cross-border collaboration. So we wanted to create a platform for these clusters and our Nordic partners to focus on cluster development and cross-border cooperation. And we've gotten great response from the other Nordic counterparts where we together see a lot of opportunities to align our interests on a Nordic scale. And this is why I'm so glad to see that in today's session, in today's event, we have participants representing companies, startups, academia, clusters, and the public sector. And on our topic for today, the battery industry and the Nordic battery belt that is taking shape. This will certainly be a massive opportunity for the Nordic countries. But of course, where there is opportunity, there is also competition. And we know that there are many countries and many companies that are investing heavily in taking charge of this industry and the market is developing at a rapid pace. And the battery industry is facing a challenge as many other industries are doing as well. Uh, satisfying the needs of the market consisting of consumer with high demands whilst producing these products and services in a sustainable way. And um, in today's fantastic lineup of speakers, I look forward to hearing about the battery value chain, 
and where we can find our opportunity to become a global player of this future industry. And working together on this, I see absolutely no reason why we would not succeed. So once again, welcome to this event. I hope you all have a productive day with a lot of new learnings and new insights. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. And now this event is officially opened. The developing Nordic battery belt stretches from Finland, the cities of Vasa and Kokkola via Sweden, the municipal of Shelefteo, to the city of Mu Irana in Norway. In this morning, we have six extremely in interesting presentations around the topic. Let's start uh, somewhere in the middle from the Kvaken. Our first speaker is Matthias Lindström from Kvarken Council. He has almost begun to build a bridge between Finland and Sweden and have so many ongoing cross-border projects in his suitcase. Today he has promised to tell us more about what is EGTC and how can it be as a facilitator. Welcome, Matthias. Thank you, Paula. I hope you can see and hear me. Somebody has to, to tell me if they don't. I will start sharing my screen immediately before I start my speech. And I hope you see it now. Wait a minute there. You see the screen? Yes, we see. Perfect. And thank you, Christian, also for, for uh, inviting us to, to uh, arrange this interesting event. And I have to start with telling you that I have caught a cold. So if I start uh, coughing during the presentation, you know the reason it's not COVID, I hope. But um, anyhow, I have a limited time to, to speak. So I will start immediately by telling you a little about the EGTC. I'm the director of the newly founded EGTC, even though the cooperation in the region has been ongoing for many years. We recently made our organization into a new uh, juridical body. And I will tell you a bit about that. But we are living interesting times in, in our region up here in the north. Uh, from a, a European perspective, we are quite up in the north. And, but uh, the, the northern part of Europe is getting more and more interesting since we had a lot of offer when talking about the green shift. We can see in front of our eyes that the, that the battery cluster is forming and a Nordic battery belt is forming in our region. And the, the companies we have mentioned here on the map is just a few examples. But in order to speed up this and to support the forming of the cluster, we need Nordic cooperation and we need cross-border cooperation that we have seen also during the years in, in other aspects and in other areas. But what we have the possibility to be, if we play our cards right, the forerunner in this aspect, not only on a European level, but also on a global level. But what do we have here then in our region that uh, other regions don't have? Yes, we have a very strong cooperation and a very established cooperation. As I said, the, the Nordic cooperation in this region and the Karkin Council was already founded in 1972. So we have been doing this in, in, for, over, for soon over 50 years. And uh, <clears throat> as I said, the unique cooperation in the region matching is matching the area we are working in is matching almost perfectly the, the Nordic battery belt and the region where this Nordic battery belt is about to be formed. We are also, you can see on the map, we have not marked out Norway yet, but uh, we are having ongoing discussions with, with Norway also joining this, this uh, type of cooperation organization. <coughs> As you see here, we have a lot of members already. And, uh, you know, this helps when promoting all kinds of different cross-border cooperation projects. And, uh, we, you know, when it's, we, we rely a lot of the, the companies, you know, coming into the reading and forming the Nordic Battery Belt, but uh, we have also to 
make sure that the public sector is on board, so to speak, because this will have huge effects on the region. We need a lot of people coming here. We have to together look into the labor market. We have to look into the education system. We have to look into to transports and so on. So this is a good opportunity to use these EGTs as a facilitator together with the public sector and the companies within the Nordic Battery Belt cluster to work together in order to, to further strengthen our position as a Nordic hub and a Nordic battery belt in this, sec in this sector. And we as an organization, we must, don't only focus on, on a battery cluster and, and a Nordic cooperation on, on transport because we work in all kinds of sectors and our task is to reduce and elim eliminate border barriers and increase the region's visibility at a national European level. And we have been doing this, as I said, successfully for many years already. So we have the, we have the, so to speak, track record to also be an active player in forming the Nordic battery belt. What is then an EGTC and what, what, how does it differ from other cooperation organizations? Uh, for firstly, it's a more powerful body that can push shared and regional important issues on a national EU level for several reasons. For example, we are a member of the EGTC platform where all the EGTCs uh, in Europe cooperate and forms also funding programs for this different uh, 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 how to you know what to uh, what to be able to fund within different funding programs and there we can be at when we are forming the programs already be on the on the platform and tell the the European Union what we need in this region to firmer to further develop these kinds of things it's also an identification identification question it's easier for us to get into to seminars and to meetings and also find partners we're all around europe in order to to further promote this establishing of the nordic battery belt it also gives us a firmer structure since we have had the the we were needed to get the permission from the Finnish and Swedish government to form this organization since it can have certain legal, legal uh, responsibility also on a national level. And visibility, of course, we are the first Nordic cross-border committee to make this change. And even though we have 12 sister organizations around the Nordic countries, we're the first one to go into this strong EGTC, that is a, an EGCC stands for European Grouping for Territorial Cooperation. But the most important thing, as I see, is that it facilitates the realization of management of cross-border development projects will be much easier, since we can, for example, act as a single beneficiary in, in, in big European cross-border projects, which means that the administration in relation to, to promoting cross-border cooperation will diminish dramatically for, for partners involved. And this is, uh, in my point of view, maybe the most important, the most important part when talking about the EGTCs. We have already started this work actually, and uh, we have several ongoing projects in relation to, to further promote the establishment of the Nordic Battery Belt. And one of the most important projects in relation to this is the Nordic Battery Belt Logistics. This is a project established uh, upon request from the Vasa Region Deve Development Company, the Kokola Regional Development Company, the municipality of Sheleftio and Rana Utvecklings Development, the Rana Development Company in, in Muirana. And in this project, we will start looking into and to make a kind of a mapping of what kind of, of raw materials available in the region, what is needed in the production process, and how can these be coordinated. And based on this, we will also make a strategy for in the use for the use also not only by by the the public sector but also for companies already established here and also to attract new investments in relation to nordic and better nordic battery belt and, and battery production and i think this will be some kind of a new unique thing because i don't know if some other region has made a cross-border strategy over three countries and several regions to make sure 
that we know how these things will work in, 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 in practice, because this will be a big benefit then when discussing also with new establishment that we have like a clue on how the transport situation, what the transport situation looks like in the region in relation to battery production. And it will also help the transport companies in the, in the region to be in order to prepare for this huge shift that will, will happen as a result of, of the establishment of the Nordic Battery Belt and the investments going on in the region. So this is a very interesting project. It has started already. We have uh, procured a consultant that's with the, under the lead of these partners I already mentioned is, uh, is uh, making, is, has started to make this, this, uh, this uh, mapping already that will result in a strategy as we as we continue forward in the project and this is a ty typical example that where you can use the egcc as a facilitator for this these companies knew and saw that this will be needed in order to further push this establishment of the nordic battery belt and then they can use the egtc as a facilitator in order to get this thing running we have the experience of, of making applications we have uh, a lot of contacts in all of the three of the Nordic countries, and we can easily get these kinds of cooperation projects started up quite quite quickly. So this is something I would like to, to tell you all in the audience that, that uh, use this opportunity that we have, because this is a, new, a unique opportunity for our region that can make us even stronger in this sector. In relation to, to battery production, we also see that we need we need communications, not only hard transport on road and rail. We also need people to be able to move within the region and in and out from the region, since we already have a strong uh, industry sector on both sides of the straits. And as a result of the, the establishment of the Nordic Battery Belt, the, the need will increase even further. And what would be better than to use also the materials produced in, in the transportation mode that we promote here in the regions. Because we have this new brand new ferry, electric hybrid ferry that use batteries as a part of, of the as a power source. And we see in front of our eyes that we our region will also be an early implementer of regional electrical uh, aviation. And this project has also been formed a couple of years ago and we are going forward fastly in this project. And this is also an example uh, as of a project that the EGCC promotes and can help the actors with. Because all, all with spread all over the region, we have a lot of small and medium sized uh, airports and it's hard for them to to have the the economical budget and the, the the muscles to do these kinds of studies that we can do together in a nordic perspective so this is something that also will affect and, and further speed up the, the the establishment of the nordic battery belt and i in, in my opinion this is a perfect way also to show the world that we are not only developing the the production line and and the batteries we are also showing the world that we also use the, pro, the the products manufactured in the region so we hope that this will result in the first cross-border region avi aviation line as soon as possible we also are looking into the future within the egtc and and uh, try to see what will this mean when talking about transport in a, a longer perspective. And not only ourselves are interested in this establishment of the Nordic battery belt and uh, the, the big investments that are being made here, because we have been approached by, by three uh, companies, international companies that have want to together with us further investigate the possibility to, to uh, build a fixed link over the Quark and Strait. And, uh, it's not maybe reasonable to do today, but maybe in 10 or 20 years. But if we want to start up new huge infrastructure investments, then we have to start today because these takes time. 
And the project we have initiated aims to create decision guiding documents that can serve as the basis for a long term cross border east west position for how the, the question of the fixed link will be promoted in the future. Because it's interesting that these, these companies, some of them have already also, you know, presented financing alternatives and they are searching for, for secure investments in, in uh, regions with a, with a high potential for development. So we are very happy that we also have initiated this project and these three projects are going on as, as we speak. But uh, my conclusion will be that we, we see that we have a very interesting period ahead of us and the future looks very bright, but we can do this together in a Nordic perspective in an even more efficient way, because we have the willingness, we have the, the history of cooperation, and we also have a new tool for making this even easier, where we can work together, the public sector and, and, uh, and the private sector in a very efficient way. So that will be my, my input to today's agenda, and, and I'm very happy to be invited to speak to you, and, and I will give the floor to Paul. Thank you so much, Matthias. And now it's your turn uh, to ask some questions and comment, Matthias. There is no uh, questions on the chat. Uh, only one question according uh, matchmaking. Uh, it is also is it also allowed uh, for German companies? Yeah, why not? Please welcome. But now uh, questions for Matthias. I can ask one question. Um, what do you think, Matthias? When can we book first electric flights across uh, Quaken? I'm a, that's a good question, and I'm a I'm a big fan of, of the, the private companies because they are pushing this development very hard at the moment. When we started the project, like one and a half years ago, people were talking about, "Oh, this will not be," you know reality before 2030 but now now some companies are talking about 19 seaters for a swedish company for example already in use and certified in 2026 so it's just around the corner and and we are now working full full power to be the first region to to be prepared when not if but when these uh, flights uh, battery driven flights will come we will be prepared and we will have the infrastructure in place and we will also have sorted out the routes and looked into the, the, the demand of the, the routes in order to make it easy for companies to come here and start flying. Great. Okay, uh, I so, I'm sorry I uh, gave wrong information uh, to answer to uh, Lars Hoffman who asked, uh, is it also allowed uh, for German companies. Uh, so Christian answered that the platform has been re registered to Nordic companies only. So unfortunately, it's not possible. But now uh, I think we can continue to our next speaker. And uh, I remind you that we can also um, have some questions and uh, discussions uh, in the in the after the six speakers if we have still time but now uh, we will uh, hop in to sweden to vesterbotten uh, it is so much going on there uh, starting from northvolt et and it seems that the speed is not the limit for you guys we are pleased to have Mr. Peter Karsten from Sheleptio Municipality to open us what happens below the surface, how to handle a rapid, rapidly growing ecosystem with existing and new businesses. Please, Peter. Okay. Um, hey. Well, good morning and thanks for having me. Uh, it was lucky this morning that I actually checked that it was finished time that <laughs> the seminar started at. So that's good. I think I will uh, uh, share my, my screen and uh, give you some uh, info regarding what happens actually when uh, a battery factory decides to establish themselves in Shlefto. Okay, can you see my screen? Just say 
something? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm responsible for the establishment here in, in uh, Schleftow. I worked in the municipality for a year. Before that, I was uh, mainly working with export business and international business, uh, uh, building up uh, companies uh, abroad in other countries, especially in the Middle East, where I've been spending a lot of years. But I'm at the municipality, and um, it's really, as you say, an, uh, a challenge. And uh, I would say that the most common questions we get is about Nordvolt, but I would say that 95, 96% of our time is spent on the consequences of Nordvolt as a result. Uh, <clears throat> this is my colleagues at uh, my business development department, my boss Anja in the middle, and my other colleagues. Uh, we mainly focus on three things. Uh, we work with startups and innovation systems. We work to develop our, our existing companies and the local ecosystem, as we call it. And now we are working a lot with the establishments. And I would say that all these three uh, areas are quite <laughs> busy at the moment uh, because of Nordvolt, of course. And interesting to understand what happens with the city. As you can see in this picture, we did a, a quite a big scenario analyzed together with Ramble. And they took uh, actually three scenarios, the low, middle, and the high. And if you're looking at the high scenario, this is where we're going. We're going to be 16,000 more people in 2030, and we're going to be 100,000 people inhabitants here in 2040. And this is quite a, a significant increase of people in Schlefto, because I think that the last 20 years, we've been more or less decreasing the municipality. We have even had houses uh, put on trucks, moved to other areas in Sweden. But uh, now it's, as, as I said, it's a quite big difference. Just to get a, a feel for it, <clears throat> it's almost 50,000 people that will work in and up around Schleftner in 2030. And that puts a lot of pressure on infrastructure, of course. Uh, we can say that 16,000 people, it's like a whole extra Kiruna would move into Schleftner. And we will uh, mainly see a lot of uh, children and young people moving in also. And in addition, you say that uh, most of the people that moves here at the moment is between 20 and 40 years old. If you look at the uh, uh, pyramid of people in Schlefto in the past, it's like we have had uh, over the years a lot of young kids and we have had a lot of old people. So uh, in between 20 and 40, uh, we didn't have that much as like Umo, for example, who, who has a different kind of, of uh, structure in the city. But the good thing is that we get, get a lot more taxpayers in to the, uh, the municipality to help supporting the, the infrastructure. Uh, if you look at, uh, at the new jobs creating in Schleft, we say that around 6,900 people we start working in the industry. And this includes, of course, the 3,000 people working in Nordvolt and that will be working in Nordvolt. We also see the service companies, Tjänste uh, it, it's around 4,300 people. We got service companies around 690. And we see the public sector is also increasing by 2,300. So this is uh, quite a challenge for us to, to actually to solve all these uh, people moving in here. We can also see that in 2030, we will have around 19,000 children and young people who want to go to preschool and school. And this is more, I would say, around 4,000 people more than today. That means that we need to build a lot of new schools. We need to build a lot of preschools, kindergartens, and everything to, to meet these demands. So uh, it's quite a, a challenge for everybody. Um, I don't think even we who live in Schlefto is still on really understands the, the magnitude of, of the change that we are actually going through at the moment. So what we are actually talking about is we always think about success here. What drives behaviors and resources will determine how well we succeed? And how do we optimize private and municipal resources best? How do we get private uh, equity in, in the city to work good with the municipality resources? This is something that we are discussing all the time to, to ensure and enable our local companies and the establishments that, that comes here to actually be successful together with us. Uh, 
we also talk about the new industrial growth place. Um, sometimes everybody wants to talk about Norfolk, but the fact is that we have a really uh, big industry, not only including Norfolk. And the consequences we've seen when we are traveling around meeting a lot of companies. Uh, me and my colleagues are doing a lot of visits to, to uh, uh, companies in Schlefto just to understand where, where they are, what, the, what their feel are, if they are feeling included and everything. So I made this uh, map just to get a little understanding and how we're building our ecosystem. When we talk about the new industrial place, we talk about Boliden, uh, Northvolt, we talk about the Rancher. We're also talking about LKAB, who has plans to make a new industrial establishment in the north. It can be Schlefto, but it also can be Ludo. Under them, we have a lot of uh, community builders like Schlefte Kraft. We got uh, consultants like WSP, Turen, Sveco, more infrastructure building and planning companies. They're usually doing tenders and helping out with uh, taking in some uh, construction companies like Skanska, NCC, Contractor, for example, Fastec to build everything. And they are also bringing in a lot of subcontractors to, to fulfill and, and, and to complete their projects like Nord Electro. This is mainly electricity companies working with installations. Uh, we also have a lot of service companies into this uh, ecosystem, uh, communication uh, bureaus working with brand, brand uh, management and so on. We also have a lot of suppliers of tools and other things. We have a lot of consultants in, in financial uh, services and so on. And if you look at this pyramid, everybody is growing. We can see at the, uh, the growth uh, statistics now for Schlefto, we can see a lot of companies are, are doubling their, their uh, revenues and, and everything. And that of course is uh, putting a lot of pressure on, on, uh, on the competence needed to build this ecosystem. And we also, when we did a lot of uh, visits to companies, we, we felt that some of them are, doesn't feel that they are included in the growth. And we, we have started to ask, why do you feel that? Yeah, well, we don't work directly with Nordvolt. That's true. But you are growing because of Nordvolt, because everybody else and every other company is really manning up to, to build their companies. Then we have, we're talking about the municipality responsibilities. And we're talking about the municipality, the regional and the state infrastructure. We can see that there are needs for uh, railways. Uh, we have needs for new roads. We have needs for new buildings, housing, everything. And everything is starting at the same time. So sometimes Schlefter looks like Dubai did in, <laughs> in 2008, 2009, when they had all the, the cranes and all the infrastructure working uh, in the city. So that's quite fun. I have a three building cranes outside of my own window and I live in the middle of the city. So uh, we're also talking about municipality values. There is a lot of values when the city is growing. I think there are statistics on, the, on that also. But what we can see in Schlefta and I'm, what I'm sure you've read in the, the papers and, and, and seen is that we had had an extreme <laughs> increase of value in housing and the housing market properties. I mean, we have uh, gone from uh, like seven, eight hundred sec uh, square meter to uh, sixteen thousand sec in some areas, and that that's really crazy. The good thing is also that banks are opening up for increased financing, <laughs> and that means that when the municipality is growing, we also see that the core is growing, meaning that the surrounding villages like Bure, Burtresk, Jörn, Buske, and Lövånger and other areas it's easier to find financing from banks now than it was before because they are more willing to take a risk since people are moving in also to the, the outer villages here in Schlefto. And this is great. We can also see a, a growth in local and non-profit sport clubs. We get a lot of questions from, from uh, people moving into Schlefto at the moment asking, hey, is there a club for, for horse riding? Is there a club for, for skiing? And is there clubs for yoga? And there's a lot of other things. We can also see that uh, we get a much more attractive tourist and visit industry. 
uh, I was talking to some of the restaurants here. They, they said they never got so much questions around, hey, what, what can we do in Schlefto? Uh, what, what can we do in, on our spare times in the week and so on? So that's really good. We also see the shopping and the restaurants are flourishing and growing. Uh, we are at, at the moment, we are speaking with several restaurants and even change that wants to move into to Schlefto. Uh, of course, uh, we can also see that we are attracting talent. We get a lot of CVs coming through our office that we are just sharing out to, to the market and to uh, people working with staffing and, and recruitment. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, some companies last week and they said, hey, we, we've been able to, to bring back some people to Schlefto that lived there when they were young and now they want to move back to Schlefto. Of course, so that's great. Uh, we can also see there is a very positive uh, stream of people moving back to Schlefto. Uh, you can all, only see it when you go uh, in the city at the moment. You hear a lot of different languages are talked in into restaurants and coffee shops and on the streets. Uh, and I lived there my whole life, more or less, but there's a lot of a lot of new people walking the streets now, and that feels like uh, more like an international city than it ever did in the past. But of course, uh, some things are also a challenge. And this is something that I think that maybe both uh, Norway and, and I think that Finland uh, should also think about. And I know that we discussed it together with Matthias and, and Norway and, and so on that. Looking at internal processing times, building permits, etc., that takes a lot longer time at the moment because the pressure is really tough on all the municipality services internally. <clears throat> so I think that having a look at, at how you handle that, that service in the future is quite important. So we don't delay things. We can also see in Schlefto now, the, there is a lack of access to land and detailed plans for how to build the city. I was talking to our, our uh, uh, planning director last uh, week and he said, hey, we need to find more land to build on. Uh, we can also see there's a lot of increased appeals uh, and longer permitted processes. Uh, and the appeals is that when they decide to build a house, the neighbors uh, that usually live there, they, they start to appeal the, the building processes and building permits. And that's uh, not always so good, of course, because that means that uh, housing can be delayed up to a year in Sweden, according to the rules. We also have a need more access uh, to living. Even in Schlefto, we are building around 5,000 uh, apartments and houses here coming five years, around 1,000 a year. I know that there is plan for much, much more than that. But uh, at the moment, we are really stressed out a little bit about the fact that uh, we are missing some apartments, of course, and, and housing. And we can see now private people is, they uh, rent out their, uh, uh, apartments and move to their summer cabins for, for the year around and uh, we can see uh, also people are buying up and re restoring old housing, building like small hotels with four or five bedrooms just to keep people in there. So, but there's a lot of job being done on the housing and, and the housing is, I would say that this is the bottleneck for Schlefto together with maybe permits and, and access to land. We also need much more staff. Uh, I was talking to one quite uh, strong company here in Schlefto. They usually they say when we, we put an ad for, for uh, hiring staff, we usually get like 40 or 50 applicants. Uh, last time they sent out the, the uh, ad, they got two people uh, wanted the job. So I would say that some in some areas, especially around the electrification, like installers, uh, electricity, uh, service and maintenance people is, is quite tough at the moment. And the competition is, is quite strong uh, among the companies. Uh, we also see chefs uh, working in restaurants. They are like the rock stars at the moment and they get some pretty nice offers from restaurants to come work for them. And uh, this is something we try to solve together with the municipality and also the private restaurants talking about how can we, as fast as possible, educate uh, chefs to work in the restaurants. 
Uh, we can also foresee the demand for schools and education is increasing. We got the English school here in Schlefto. Uh, I know there's also a lot of demands for having more international schooling in Schlefto. And I think that's also coming here uh, from next year. We can also actually see some increased crime rates here uh, with drugs and so on, but that's talking to police, that's quite normal uh, since uh, since there's a lot of people coming in, a lot of new people coming into the city, there's a lot of money and investments floating around here in, in, in the city, of course. So that's something that we also try to work with. But uh, in, the, in the end, we always think that are we prepared to do what it takes to actually solve things? Uh, even if we need to work very strategic uh, in the long run, we need to work very actively in the short term to solve a lot of things and without not losing the focus on, on the long-term strategy that we have. What we see is also that's, that's really great is that we see a lot of local companies are really doing a great job at the moment. They are growing, they are investing, they are building new housing, they are uh, growing out of their, their current businesses and try to build new businesses. Uh, we can see a lot of collaborations in, internally in the city where companies are going together in small cluster buildings and trying to solve things together. Uh, we can see the, uh, the landowners and, and also the, uh, the people who owns all the uh, uh, real estate here in the city goes together talking more, okay, how can we solve it? In the past, it was more like maybe how can I solve it? But now we, there's a lot of much more we thinking and mentality now in the city. And I think that we realized here in Schlefto now that we can't do it alone. We need to do it together. We need not only to do it together with Schlefto, we need to do it together with the surrounding municipalities like Malo, Norsche, Umeå, Luleå, Pito. The challenge is so big, so we all need to be a part of, of this. As we are together with the, the battery belt here with Matthias and, and Norway and, uh, and Vasa to, to together decide about how do we build this together? How do we create a ecosystem that support each other in the best way. So if we are prepared or not, I say that, yeah, we are almost there, even if we are in the beginning of the, of the journey so far. But um, yeah. That was my last picture. So. Thank you so much, Peter. The magnitude of the growth is something, it is huge. It's so hard to imagine that within eight years, six, 16,000 new inhabitants in the area. So many, many things, like you said, have to be done. And uh, like we all know, many areas in, in Finland and Sweden and Norway have same kind of challenges, big challenges. And uh, this is the direction many areas are, are going. And the big worry, I guess, is, is that, that uh, can we solve it? Um, what a, we, yeah, what I do you think? No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I can just say one thing. Uh, yeah. uh, some, something that we learned uh, during this year is also that never underestimate the need for information in the society and in the municipality. Uh, we, we think that we are communicating and informing in, in every channel that we have, but I realize when we, we come to companies here, they are so occupied with doing their thing all the time. So. Uh, when we come and inform and give information, say, hey, this is really useful. We didn't know that. So sometimes to more be more able to explain the why we are doing things. Why are we shutting down bridges? Why are we closing roads? Why, why are we closing this school? Why are we not building new when we can? So there, there we need to always dis describe the why and include people in the communication. Yeah. yeah. That, that's one of the key uh, things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was good. Good point. Uh, what do you think uh, about this attraction? Does it come by itself uh, with these investments and these new workplaces? 
or what what is the need for marketing and and uh, that kind of uh, things what can we learn from you i think in in terms of uh, attracting people uh, we are doing a lot of uh, efforts and and and, and re- different things to attract people we are marketing ourselves through different projects like relocate uh, uh, visiting a, a lot of areas in sweden where they have a high uh, unemployment trying to attract people here uh, we're doing a lot of marketing through our marketing department in left the municipality doing a lot of activities to increase the the activity for left and attractivity and uh, yeah we we see people moving home a lot of people are turning home because uh, they want to be part of building this a lot of people are moving home left left the ones and they still got their grandparents and things here so that's also a social part you know coming closer to the networks uh, yeah but still we we need a lot more people coming here uh, that's a fact i mean norcold has not even started to hire more or less they're going to hire 1500 people next year so it, it's really yeah. Uh, what, ab- what about the Nordic cooperation? Um, do you have any concrete ideas uh, what could and what should we do together with uh, Sweden, Finland and Norway? Yeah, if I'm just be frank, I think that it, I think it's good that we talk, discuss and, and share re- uh, experiences because uh, at the moment we are taking a lot of hits because we are like first to market with the battery factory. But we also have Norway and Finland coming now, so I think that it's better to talk a little bit too often than, than less, uh, and helping you to avoid mistakes and uh, helping you to avoid cost that's usually related to mistakes. So that's a fact. We've been like pioneering a little bit up in the north, and I think that we are in the similar situation, uh, Moirana and also Vasa in Finland. Yeah. So I, I think it's good that we have the discussion and, and keep continuing talking about how we can together work, work with this. And, yeah. and this includes the whole region, not only like the, the three cities here. Thanks. Uh, I will take one question from the chat. Uh, uh, how do you look into uh, addressing the future's mu- multi-language uh, or multicultured influx of people into the area in terms of, of organizing education and services. This is something also we discuss quite a lot in Finland. Uh, this is something that we are, we are when, we, when we see companies and talk to, to companies up here, we, we always address that question. Uh, how, how would it be like, can you uh, consider hiring people that doesn't speak Swedish, but like speak English or something? And uh, yeah, I, th- I think that the, the attitude and mentality, they realize that this is something we need to l- understand better. Um, some uh, directors in companies says, yeah, I don't have an issue with it, but I'm not sure what my staff will say, you know, working on the floor because they are not used to speaking English, maybe. So I think that this is a learning curve. Uh, we need to understand that it, it's here and we just need to understand how we can start working with it. But we're not afraid for, for that, definitely. Yeah, thanks. That sounds quite familiar. But we st- we shall continue now. Uh, thank you, Peter. Engong uh, Til. Our next speaker is also known, uh, Mr. Gigavasa. Mark Kuokkanen with his team worked to enable possibilities for the future battery industry development in the Vasa region. Logistic and the excellent location plus closeness uh, and the av- availability of minerals and refineries makes the place even more unique. But what makes battery product greener? Battery production greener? That's what Marco is going to talk <coughs> about more. We are happy to have you today with us, Marco. So please, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Paula, uh, and, and thank you, Peter. Uh, somehow it was uh, very, very nice to hear Peter's comments regarding the problems, or let's say that what the growth really brings. And, and uh, uh, before I start to talk about the greener battery production, I have to tell 
one story before the COVID times and, and uh, on those days we used to travel a lot to, to Asia and, and uh, especially of course China, Japan and Korea and, and uh, many times of course uh, I was very happy to talk about uh, VAS and, and, uh, and the Scandinavia and Nordic battery belt and investments here in, in Scandinavia and, and uh, then I realized that uh, many of this uh, companies and the persons which I was speaking to, they, they had actually no idea where the Finland is and, and what is the Scandinavia. So that somehow, let's say, that uh, uh, made me understand that, of course, uh, from the other side of the planet, the world looks very different than it looks uh, from, from our direction. That is something what is uh, good for us to remember. But uh, let's start my presentation and, and uh, let's go through what has been going on in a, in a, in a vase and, and uh, can you by the way see my screen yes no. can you see it now no i i cannot see it. i have a luxury to have a new computer so so maybe we should do it so that uh, if you could present my material from from your direction Let's try once again. And now we can see it. Now you can see? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, it's always a luxury when you have a new computer. You, so you had a new, uh, it's called demo effect. Okay, but uh, before I start, some, some uh, background from Vasa. So uh, what is actually the reason why we started this battery journey and of course it's this uh, local very strong energy industry and, and uh, here are the big players such as ABB, Hitachi, Wärtsilä and Danfoss and, and uh, they make a global business and, and uh, we started to quite uh, soon to understand that all of these companies they need a different kind of let's say that uh, batteries for, for the applications and, and uh, th this was really the reason that uh, why we started to work uh, uh, with the batteries and and, uh, and uh, we started our journey with, with this uh, Tesla announcement and, and after that uh, uh, Northvolt was starting their journey and, and uh, we were applying uh, to this competition and, and uh, actually Shellefteå and Northvolt helped us a lot to, to move on and, and, and uh, to understand more about the battery business and, and uh, if you look, look this, uh, what has been going on in the Vasa, let's say that uh, during the last years, uh, Vasa is a very strong, let's say that uh, university town and we have a lot of students and an energy cluster has uh, 12,000 employees uh, working with the energy. And, and uh, we made a survey to the local companies that uh, how much investments they're gonna do uh, for the five years and, and uh, on, on that time, a few years ago, they said that it's going to be like 1.2 billion euros. And, and uh, this investment, investment sum is without this uh, battery investments at all. So it is very strongly showing that uh, the local in industry is uh, strongly, let's say, investing the, to the future. When we started our journey, uh, of course, we analyzed uh, about the competition and quite fastly we realized that, uh, of course, all the countries, they were willing to get this investment uh, to their countries and, and uh, being here in the north and, and, and uh, is sometimes a bit of a challenge. And, and, uh, but we realized that uh, actually this uh, green shift or green transition is, is a possibility for us. and, and uh, at the same time, let's say that the uh, car industry and, and, and uh, European Parliament, they are very strongly pushing on a, on a low CO2 footprint throughout the value chain. And, and uh, we realized that actually this is the very good possibility for us to, to, to move on, the, on this direction. And, and uh, we have invented few quite, let's say, unique ways to, to, to minimize uh, the carbon footprint. And, and, uh, one of them is a, a thermal heat recovery and, and uh, 
we know that the battery industry and, and cathode manufacturing, they're actually creating a lot of uh, heat, uh, which is, let's say, that the most of that uh, goes as a waste heat. And, and uh, we have implemented a solution that we could collect this waste heat so that uh, the city of Vasa would actually uh, could use this heat uh, in the district heating pipelines. Other topic uh, which ha has been important for us is that uh, because we are in this uh, Quarken area and, and uh, our nature is, is quite unique. So, so from the starting point, we wanted to implement the closed loop systems and, and uh, so that uh, to minimize the emissions to the sea and, and uh, Actually, actually, by, by doing that, so the water consumption, uh, for example, for a cooling is, is uh, dropping really dramatically. And, and uh, this is very important, important uh, for us. We have a huge area, so it's uh, 330 uh, hectares. And, and, and uh, of course, we are now aiming to to get uh, not only the cell manufacturing, but uh, more we can actually have this uh, value chain manufacturing in the same place. It actually is, is, is minim minimizing this carbon footprint because less logistic routes you need, of course, this uh, final uh, CO2 footprint figure uh, is minimized. So, I guess you have heard about the Johnson Matthew news and 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 uh, and, and the Friar news and and uh, I on on a day when Johnson Matthew announced that they're going to sell their let's say that uh, battery business. Of course, on 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 that day, it wasn't the best day. But uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, actually Johnson Matthew has uh, helped really us uh, a lot forward and and. Uh, Throughout this uh, journey with them, of course, all this, uh, uh, let's say, infrastructure planning and, and engineering has has moved really a lot to, to forward. And, and, and uh, so now with, with the prior memorandum of, of understanding, we are ready to, to start us on, on building this uh, infrastructure investments. And, and, and uh, so we are really much more forward than let's say a couple of years ago. So, so let's say that now we are able to enable a, a fast start for, for incoming companies. And, and uh, also let's say that uh, through with this uh, Johnson Matthew and Friar, let's say announcements, uh, it has uh, guaranteed us for uh, an extremely, let's say that a busy year. So we have a lot of companies who are interested to, to be located on an area and, and uh, let's say that uh, hopefully during the, the next months, let's say that uh, we will get some, some new positive announcements. One thing, as you can see from the picture, uh, this is also quite, quite unique area. So uh, a lot of this kind of, let's say, nature protected areas has been left uh, on, on the design in, in the area. So, so this is a very, very unique uh, chemical battery industry area. But uh, let's look a little bit at the projects. And, and uh, I, I took a map uh, about the current, let's say, that the cell manufacturing projects. And, and uh, as you can see, there is a lot of plans ongoing. And, and, uh, and uh, like we heard from Peter from Shell FTO, uh, after getting this investment started, uh, it's, it will start the race to, to get this uh, skilled workforce. and, and, and uh, and we also here in, in, in Vasa, we have been thinking uh, that how do, how do we can attract this uh, skilled workforce to, to work for the batteries? And, and uh, of course, the local schools and universities uh, will, will train a lot of people, but uh, it is obvious that uh, we need, also need some uh, experienced talents uh, abroad. And, and, uh, and that is really a good question that uh, for us, that how, how really can we can attract uh, these talents to to, to Nordics and and uh, but it's 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 looking looking really good. So uh, Northwold really really opened the, the gate and 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 uh, now we can see that uh, there is a three investment plans in in Norway and and, and uh, one in Finland and uh, hopefully there is a lot more to come. But uh, let's jump to the Finland strengths and and. Uh, 
uh, in Europe, I think Finland is, is quite unique because uh, we have these uh, materials and mines uh, close by in, in, in Finland and uh, and uh, on, on this west coast, we are located in a quite optimal place because on both sides, we have these refineries, which also is making Finland unique. So we have in Kokkola, we have a, a Freeport Cobalt and, and, and a Kaliber, which is, let's say, hopefully proceeding with their investments. And, and uh, on the south side, we have in Harjavalta, we have a Nornis Nickel and, and Basf and, and Fortum, which is uh, focusing on, on a recycling. And also, this is a little bit old map, but uh, there is announced that uh, in, in, in Kotka and Hamina, there will be, let's say that uh, together with the uh, Finnish Minerals Group, uh, they have a joint venture with two Chinese players, CNG Air, Air and eSpring. So those projects are also, also moving forward. And uh, when we start to have this scattered manufacturing, of course, uh, hopefully, let's say that uh, with the anode manufacturing and, and uh, cell manufacturing, and then we have, let's say, that uh, the final customers in, in, in Finland. So we will have, a, let's say, that the full package of, of different kind of actors in a, in a, in a, in a Finnish value chain. And uh, of course, more invest we are, we are getting to, to Finland, Sweden and Norway, it will help us all to, to move, move forward. So this is the, the map from, from Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And, and, uh, and um, if I somehow conclude the thing, so, so of course uh, the Sweden and, and the Northworld hype was, let's say that uh, opening up this, uh, this battery journey in, in, in the Nordics. And, and uh, already before that, uh, Norway was a front, front runner in the EVs and, and uh, they have the highest amount of, of EVs in, 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 in the whole world. And, and uh, they have really been, let's say that, uh, also front runners on, on electrical vehicles. vehicles and, uh, and Finland, very strong on, on mines and refineries. So, so now we can see that uh, all these parts, we, we will start to get uh, new investments. But, uh, what makes it possible? Uh, I, I wrote there a kick of us a sustainability and, and uh, have the, having this kind of, let's say, that uh, sustainable energy like a wind and hydro and, and uh, having that in, in, in a com competitive pricing, that is actually something which is uh, really uh, interesting to, to this kind of, let's say, that the big investments because really this. Uh, Energy is a, is a very, very, uh, let's say that uh, important part on a, on, a, on a production. This is uh, how the area looked like. So actually this is the Johnson Matty plot and, and, and uh, in, a, in a Vasa, we have a lot of rocks on the top of this uh, topsoil and, and, uh, and actually this, uh, using these uh, rocks and, 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 uh, and the boulders as a materials for a construction, it was a very sustainable, sustainable way to, to, to start building of the area. Some example, I, I took this uh, slide from the fryer and, and, and uh, we were extremely happy to, to start working with the fryer because uh, we were really sharing the same values and, and, and uh, because our target was to, to, to create the world cleanest area for a battery production and, and uh, Fryer has the same, same value and the same mission. So, so we are extremely happy to, to start, start working with them. And, and uh, as, a, as a final slide, uh, let's say that uh, Fryer is doing the same like Northwald was uh, doing in, in Sweden. So, so they, they had an idea, of course, that uh, Northwold had a, had a Westeros plant and, and a Fryer has a plant in Muirana, so where they will make this project development and, and uh, start uh, the productions. And, and uh, when this, let's say that uh, there is a need for, for a gigafactor and a scaling, uh, we hope to be the place where this is going to happen. So I think we are, we are running out of time, so I'm going to 
stop my presentation here. So if you have any questions or, or Paula, you have a question, so you are free to ask. Thank you, Marco, so much. Uh, there has came one question to the chat. Uh, how is the permit processes and government attitude for mining cobalt and other minerals in Finland? Would you like to answer? Well, uh, I'm not the expert for the mining, so uh, I prefer to answer on, on, on our part. So we have this environmental processes ongoing and, and, and uh, actually at the moment with, with the fryer, fryer batteries. And, and uh, the good thing is that uh, because this permitting for the area has been done like five years ago. And, and uh, so we have a lot of, let's say, materials. And, and uh, I, I think there is a there is like this kind of let's say that uh, everybody is willing to help let's say that there are new actors to move on of course you have to respect all these rules and and and, and uh, what is required but i think it is moving on a on a positive way and and uh, of course sometimes we hear that uh, there is some slowliness but uh, of course the processes has to go uh, to go through and and uh, and uh, we also know that uh, when when authorities sometimes are doing it the first time, of course, it will can take a little bit more time, but uh, hopefully in the second time, it's it's much faster. Great, thank you. Next, we will continue in Finland, about 120 kilometers from Vasa to north to the city of Kokkola. There is also the largest inorganic chemical industry ecosystem in Northern Europe, where operate several leading chemical and metal processing industries. Uh, this side of the Quarken, very near Kokkola, is also lithium reserves, which have, have been estimated to be among the most significant in whole Europe. Development director at the city of Kokkola, Jonne Sandberg, is promised uh, to tell us about transforming existing business into the future and developing infrastructure. Please, Jonne Sandberg, the st Thank stage you. is yours. Thank you. I will try to share the screen first of all. So this is always as exciting. Now we can see. It. Okay, that's great. First, first task completed today, and then when we get it still, uh, present. okay. Well, good morning from my part also, and, and nice to hear some interesting speeches before for my my turn. Um, I try will try to open up uh, in in a brief way what we have been doing in Kokkola at Kokkola Industrial Park because I think there is a message to all of us also that you have to be prepared for the future you have to do things for for the future how how to be competitive in the future and Kokkola Industrial Park is one of the in most interesting cases in transforming the businesses from, from government owned to, to private owned and in, into multinational owned companies structure. So Kokka Industrial Park's history started after Second World War when Finnish government decided to put a factory as far away from Russia and, and or Soviet Union and, and also from Helsinki. So they looked at the map, Kokkola, nice coastline, good beach, let's put a factory there. So we had uh, two state-owned companies, Kemira and Autokumpu there. Uh, in early, was it 2003, 2004, there started to happening things at the site. Uh, Kemira announced that, that they will split out their businesses and uh, the local directors understood straight away that Kemira's operations in Kokkola are not the core operations for Kemira in the future and something will happen. And, and this is my favorite part. You, you don't have to wait until somebody comes and switches off the lights and then asks for government money to transform the site into something for the future. You can proactively work with the site, develop the things and be prepared for the future. And that's pretty much what happened then in, in early days of uh, 2000 and, and so on. Um, 
local directors did contact uh, city and also the regional council and we started on a real big job to transform the site from from two company site into a multinational site and and we have succeeded today so today there is 19 production companies on the site uh, we have a few investments coming already and everything looks pretty brilliant for the future of course also uh, circular economy have been a big part of kokkola industrial park in history and it's still today and we are strengthening those issues today and and forward in the future the circular economy idea is that uh, one company's uh, side material can be one other's company's raw material and products are shipped from one one side to another side via pipelines and and so on then we have common uh, uh, environmental monitoring systems and, and are monitoring the whole site together with all the companies. So nobody is doing that, or everybody is, of course, is doing on their behalf it, but then we have all, everybody doing it also together. So we have a common monitoring system. Jonne, that, that, may yeah. I interrupt you? Uh, yeah. You should put a presentation mode on. We still see the first slide. Okay, well, that's interesting because it works for me at least. <laughs> what slide is it changing now? Uh, now we can set, uh, see the chemical streams. Okay, this is interesting because okay because it switches on my my screen at least. But then yeah, okay, let's <laughs> I will go the hard way, so no problem. So, but the, the side streams, you can see them now. Thanks, Paula, for, for interrupting. Uh, the side streams are looking like this. So, so it's, it seems to be that that's the way to go. Um, then I have a few pictures of the companies located on the site. I won't, won't use so much time into that, but you can see the site is it divided in northern and southern parts. Then we have the port tower building. I will come back to that later on also. Um, Let's jump. I will go to the straight away to the Port Tower building. Uh, Port Tower is is also one interesting building that we managed to build ten years ago to the site, uh, and and this is also in the process of transforming the the old site into a new site. Uh, all traffic today is going via the Port Tower building, and before it did go through two or three different gates and, and we di didn't really have the big picture and, and control of what is happening on the site. Today, everybody who visits the site, they have to go via port tower and get the safety instructions and, and meet also uh, their hosts there. Uh, they are picked up from there. So in, in a security way, port tower is a, is a good building. And of course, we have been able to reduce a lot of the traffic into the site from um, by having, for example, meetings at Port Tower and, and not bringing people into the into the site for meetings and different um, events and, and things. So, um, of course, the, the big thing in the industrial park generation and, and, and developing the industrial park for the future need is also that we have uh, been looking into the synergies between companies trying to work with multinational companies on a local level together. That's also a challenge because their headquarters from, from USA or, or China or wherever want to say how, how they should operate. And, and of course, on the local level, you have to have a bit different um, thoughts and opinions or, and, and try to find out the synergies with other companies on the side. Uh, but I think we have managed quite well. Um, there have been a lot of investments into the site of the companies operating there. Uh, and, and really, when you look at the global map, Coco is just a, a place on the map out in, in the global world. And we are able to keep the companies here and invest here so they see the added value of working at, at the industrial park. So we are kind of competitive. Mm. Let's go still with that one. 
Uh, there is 2,300 employees on the site at the moment. Uh, it have been in, the amount of employees have been increasing uh, during the last years. Uh, in 2006, I think it was 1,800 employees. And new investments into the site have been roughly 100 million euros per year. So uh, the big message that I really have is is to be is to be proactive uh, by developing uh, the infrastructure, developing uh, operations together between companies. That's that's important. And um, at the site we have also. Uh, Coco Industrial Park Association and, and all the big companies on the site are members um, in the association. And, and this association do have some subgroups, uh, HR, environmental, ICT, safety, and, and marketing also. Um, and, and different companies are meeting um, annually or a few times per year to discuss uh, common topics around the different matters and, and issues that they have. But that might be, I will uh, switch, jump a few slides because the technique is, is not working that properly. Mm, we have always been speaking about the plug and play concept. And I think this is also about transforming the business also for the future and, and bringing up new ideas, how to work in the future. Uh, the idea is that it's very easy to set up your business at our industrial park, but it's also easy to leave from there, but you don't want to leave from there because you feel it's it's so good to be there. So uh, an, an company that sets up their business at the industrial park, they just can choose services, they can choose commodities that they need, uh, and you don't have to matter just about your own core business at the site. Of course, in the, the plug and play concept, we have uh, research and development with uh, Centria, University of Applied Sciences, our university consortium. They are doing the research and development uh, in a tight cooperation between, between uh, companies and, and uh, themselves also. And of course, again, finding uh, labor and people and, and, and being on the market is an important topic there. I will take one last slide to, to finalize up. Um, we have also um, so, south of Kokkola, we have a new area, which is 136 hectares at the moment, uh, called Kokkola South, or, or in, in Finnish Kronoporti at the moment, at least. We are still struggling with the name. Uh, this is a totally new area owned by the city, and we are thinking about the infrastructure at the moment, how to handle it there, uh, border, electricity, railway, and so on. Luckily, we have a lot of connections already there, so, so we can just think that they are pretty much fixed. Now we are going into the service part and trying, out, trying to find out how to cooperate with the Kokkola Industrial Park that do have a lot of the infrastructure and services already there. How we can enlarge uh, Kokkola Industrial Park into this new area that is roughly 10 kilometers away from the original industrial park. So that's, that's what we are working on for the future in, in, in many different industrial things. Just a quick glimpse uh, to, to finalize up and wrap up. Uh, in the battery chemicals sector, Kokkola is, of course, an interesting location. As mentioned earlier, Caliber is setting up their lithium production factory here. Uh, Yervoa, Finland, bought uh, Freeport's final shares in Kokkola, and they are aiming to to develop, of course, the cobalt refinery activities that we have here in Kokkola. And then we have Yumikor already producing precursor materials today. And, and they, of course, have, have plans for the future. And then Bulliden is an, an interesting player also because they have some materials that might be kind of interesting for future battery production. So we have a lot of uh, companies already in the battery sector here. 
and then of course, as many of us know, we have the research and development part of, of Oulun yliopisto and Ulla Lassi in Kokkola also. If you look at the Nordic battery belt, that is really the topic for today, I, I think the biggest common interest uh, should be how to attract uh, skilled workers and skilled people into the area in the future. And, and doing cooperation there uh, regarding education and, and attracting people here. That is a, a big topic that we really could cooperate in the future. But um, yeah, just to conclude up, um, it's important to be ready for the future and don't when, wait until somebody comes and switches off the lights and shout for the money. Just do it before and, and take the things and actions into your own hands before somebody else comes and do, do, does it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonne. Would you like to answer yourself to your question how to attract skilled workforce? in Kokkola and, and near region. <laughs> how, how we do it or, or how, what, what is the idea? I think there, there should be the, the cooperation between, uh, of course, we are speaking a lot about on the Finnish part and, and so on, but of, uh, I think Vasa, Seinejoki and Kokkola really should tighten up the, the uh, cooperation and also looking into Sweden. But of course, we are trying to do marketing in the region, uh, education is a big part, Centria is, is in the battery, um, chemicals education, they are quite forerunners also, so to promote their, their skills. Uh, during Kokkola Material Week a few weeks ago, uh, there was uh, started up an initiative uh, that we really should, uh, in Finland, um, join our forces between the different regions that are working in the battery chemicals and try to boost up the education so so but i think trying to get edu education for the start to start up that you get really have the possibilities to get the education here and then it's just to attract people that wasn't not an easy answer <laughs> yes thank you Jonne. i will take a uh... If there is no other questions, I will take a question from the chat as an excellent transition to our next speaker. And it goes like this. Uh, there is usually a lot of talk about raw materials, metals, manufacturing, logistics and applications. Who will focus on collecting and recycling used batteries and materials? This section must be managed, managed in parallel with all other developments, including the develop, development of competencies, challenges, risks, and opportunities in terms of material. Who will take care of this? And uh, Mr. Jörgen Erdal, uh, I think you have at least one kind of uh, answer to that, that question uh, with your uh, presentation, how repurposing enables maximum value creation from every battery. Welcome, please. Thank you for that, Paula, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this event. Uh, my name is Jürgen Erdal. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Repack, which is a company working with reuse of Second Life EV batteries. So I'm going to share my screen now and uh, let me know if you can't hear me well uh, for yes, some we reason. We can hear and see as well. Fantastic. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Okay, so today I'm going to talk a bit about Repack. We're a early phase startup from uh, based in Norway in Oslo, which is working with, as I said, uh, reusing discarded electric vehicle batteries. And also as Paula introduced that, how can this actually contribute to maximize the value of every battery? So today we heard a lot about uh, the production of new batteries and how that will demand a lot from, uh, from the communities and the companies in the Nordic region. 
but we also have to remember the end of life in in this very important industry and that is where we are we are located and working on i think i don't need to spend a lot of time to uh, to convince the participants in this call that the demand for energy storage will grow dramatically over the next years and, and this is one of the numbers that you might find online from bloomberg new energy finance saying that the installed capacity of battery in energy storage will grow my, more than 170 times in the two coming decades. And at the same time, we are seeing that we're scrapping more and more batteries, which is a, uh, a uh, bad thing when we know that we need all these battery energy storage systems. And McKinsey have estimated that the discarded volumes will grow that by more than 200 times in this decade, growing to over 200 gigawatt hours a year on, uh, on a global basis. And that's close to 3 million electric vehicles, uh, personal cars being discarded every year. And that is only personal cars as well. So if you also add on top commercial vehicles, buses, marine applications, the numbers are many, many times larger. And although we can, could recycle all of them, and which is a good thing, uh, today, 95% are just scrapped. They're actually not reused, recycled at all. And luckily that more and more of them are being recycled because of the building of recycling facilities uh, like the Hydrovolt facility in, in Norway through the joint venture between Hydro and, and Northvolt and, and many other actors are coming in. But the, the sad thing about this is that at least one out of three of these batteries are fully functional with more than 80% remaining capacity, meaning they can live up to 10 years or more in a second life application. And with that in mind, the only thing that makes sense is to really reuse them. And I'll get a bit more into that. But to, to zoom out a bit to understand how the, the full value chain uh, works today, is that today it's a linear process where, um, where uh, materials are mined, we produce a battery, they're put into a car, and at the end of life, a lot of them are scrapped today. And then luckily, we, we see more and more recycling coming into play where batteries are taken back from the end of vehicle life, disassembled, sent for material recycling, and then back for the manufacturing of new batteries. But as this is still an immature part of the industry, this is still a cost to, to the participants and something that needs to mature and that will mature. But as we just learned that if one out of three of these batteries are still fully functional, what only makes sense is that we make sure to maximize the value of every battery by adding on repurposing as another loop to this value chain. So where, where we can then test and sort the batteries that comes from this assembly, we can then reassemble them into new battery systems and then send them into operation for 10 or more years. And when they then are at the really end of life, we can send them back for material recycling. And thus we are not taking anything out of the value chain, we're just making sure that we maximize the value from every battery within. And this is where we in Repack come in, uh, where we are striving towards repurposing these electric vehicle batteries into high quality and scalable battery systems for a range of different applications and in real estate and construction and grid applications and many more applications from, from residential co consumer products to high end commercial and industrial products. And how does this work? So what we are working on building up in, in Repack is a data-driven approach to identifying the best performing modules, to configuring them into new battery systems and operating them. So these modules comes from this assembly and that can be from the car industry itself. It could be from recyclers or also from manufacturers themselves. Then we are able to test and sort to understand which of these are actually good enough for a second life, meaning that we can take them on into the next stage where we are then able to reassemble them into new battery systems that can then go into operation in a second life. And when they are put into second life, we are then continuously monitoring them to understand how these second life batteries behave 
so that if one of them should out, uh, underperform, we can actually go in and swap it out in or order to, as we said, maximize the value of every battery within the value chain. And then send the batteries that are the modules that cannot be reused anymore for material recycling. So I mean, to make sure that we recuperate valuable materials. And what we are building and already have built in order to facilitate this is what we call the battery cloud, which is an online solution where we are then able to capture value from all of the, these steps. And then over time, able to classify modules to understand which of them are good enough to do system assembly optimization, meaning that the system can help you identify which of these hundreds of modules or thousand modules you have in stock should go into the five module uh, system that you're selling. You can do predictive maintenance in the sense that you can identify that a battery is degrading before it really is. And you can do live system lifetime optimization, meaning that by actually understanding how the battery is behaving, you're able, you can actually increase or decrease the operating envelope in order to prolong or, or shorten lifetime, if that's an interest for you as well. And I think it goes a lot without saying why, why this is a good and a win-win opportunity for both people and planet. Uh, but I'll quickly go through uh, anyway. And, and firstly is, of course, lower uh, cost battery systems. So because we're able to source battery modules uh, at a much lower cost than, than new ones, we can, of course, then also sell these systems into and at a much lower cost. And our, our longer term ambition is to be able to sell in at half the price of new systems. The second thing is, of, well, of course, on, on lower carbon footprints, that, that even though the, the green or the battery production of or production of batteries from the northern countries will be much greener, Today, many of the batteries come for, comes from coal-fired um, plants and facilities uh, elsewhere, which has a significant carbon footprint. Thirdly, is the extraction of rare earth minerals. So especially car batteries are based usually on uh, NMC technology, meaning that uh, material, the material of cobalt is an especially uh, ethical also uh, problem uh, mineral. Also, we don't have to extract more of these minerals in order to produce a new battery for the application that we can use a repurpose one. And the, the fourth one here is, I think, often forgotten is that a, a battery from an electric vehicle is usually of a much higher quality than from a, a general low kind of low quality insurance product, LFP product from, from other countries. So to remember that the a car manufacturer usually goes through up to three years of technical due diligence before they select a battery cell to go into a battery modules that goes into their cars. So these are really top-notch uh, battery cells and, and modules. And so we've been talking a lot about electric vehicles, and that is, of course, the starting point from what we are building. Being based in Norway, as we've seen in the previous presentations today as well, we are leading in the, the share of electric vehicles. And this is something we can leverage to build this competency about repurposing and reuse before we also then expand to other sources of batteries, because bus and truck is also getting increasingly electrified and marine batteries as well. And uh, Koivus and Siemens are, are just two examples of battery manufacturing uh, plants that are in, in Norway, or at least module manufacturing that takes place in Norway for the maritime industry. And over time as well, you can also add in new batteries. Uh, and I should, probably should have added a few more logos to, to that slide before today, obviously, but I think that you, it paints a picture of kind of the, the growth opportunities ahead. And coming from Norway, we have a unique starting point to, to become leaders in this field of reuse. And we have high ambitions and the ambitions are to become European leaders in, in the reuse batteries by 2025 and world leaders by 2030. And interesting in this space, and how can we actually leverage uh, the position we have in the Nordics to, to grow a new export venture into the rest of the world? 
is that each market will eventually have batteries uh, in because of cars being sold, because of the, the markets just being developed. And when each market then starts to, uh, to grow up, we can actually then export and grow into the rest of the world using the competency that we built in Norway, in the Nordics. And then we can export testing approach and requirements. Uh, we can export hardware that goes around the battery itself, including the electrical architecture, operational quality assurance procedures, and marketing and sales channels, meaning that we leverage the position we have in the Nordics in order to grow externally when the markets hit certain trigger points. And this is something we cannot do alone. This is something we need to collaborate uh, in order to, to, to get this opportunity. And that is why I thought this event was such a great, great idea and that we, we would love to participate here, is that we, we are strong believers that we, we need partnerships and collaborations to, to make this happen. And as I already talked a lot about is how we are, are will live in coherence with recycling we will not compete with recycling we will we will make sure to together live to maximize the available value so today we have are working with many, several investors and research partners in order to maximize the value and, and, and reach our ambitions and but we are more than well or we are more than uh, willing to discuss new partnerships across the nordic region in order to to grow uh, this this great business so where are we as a company now? We are we're still early phase. We're just about uh, over one year old, and we are concluding what we call our proof of concept stage, meaning that we have now delivered seven systems to, to paying customers, uh, one of which is the, the largest module-based commercial industrial system um, delivered in Norway. So to date, it's 220 kilowatt hours, and we're growing that pipeline for next year. And also, because of our, our ambitions are to become European leaders by 2025, we, we need to go internationally sooner rather than later. So by the end of next year, we should have been entering uh, and giving sales to at least five countries in the European Union, and then using that to, to grow even further towards 23 and, and, and beyond. So that was uh, what I wanted to share today about uh, this opportunity. And I would love to, to hear from anyone watching this if you see areas for collaboration or, or partnerships. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jürgen. Um, I think you already answered to this one question, but I still uh, can repeat it. How does Repack plan to have a, a, access to EUL batteries. What kind of volumes are you handling today? Yes, so we are working directly with car manufacturers and also recyclers in order to ensure that we're able to get large quantities from stable and qualified sources. So we're already sourcing directly from a German car manufacturer today. And we're also working with a, a Nordic recycler to, to ensure a long-term agreement as well. And in terms of the volumes we're sourcing now, by the end of this year, we should have delivered at least 350 kilowatt hours. So rather small, but ramping up. By next year, that number should have been, uh, should, should be 10 times larger, reaching between three and four megawatt hours, or even more if you're able to, to grow faster than we, we foresee now. Yes, thank you. Uh, there is also two links uh, in the chat. Uh, one came uh, about, uh, it is about uh, one reuse implementation, uh, Trace Grow, uh, which is uh, making uh, fertilizers uh, from used alkaline batteries. So if you are interested about that, uh, there is a link. Mm. And another link, uh, you can find uh, secondlifestorage.com. But yes, uh, thank you, uh, yes. Jürgen. And uh, we will continue to our last speaker. Uh, very important presentation. We have heard uh, about ecosystems and clusters. 
And now we have a real cluster specialist, Christian Poske from Innovation Norway. Uh, she is with us today. Please share your wisdom uh, to us, uh, Christian. <laughs> How can clusters play a role in developing the Nordic battery belt? Thank you, Paula, and thank you for inviting me, and also thank you to all the other uh, speakers. It's been such a great morning. I've learned a lot. So let me share some of my thoughts on, on this uh, question about how can, how can clusters play a role uh, in developing the Nordic battery belt. Um, I think before uh, we move into clusters, I would, I would like to kind of stop a bit on, on why the Nordics. Um, because as some of you have already mentioned, there is a race going on in, in Europe, building you know, the new battery industry for, for, for Europe. I think both COVID-19 and also you know, the increase in, in battery use have shown that Europe cannot be as dependent on Asia as it is today. So they need to actually build um, you know, a, a battery industry that is closer to, to, the, the, to the European market. So, so why the Nordics? Why are we particularly good? Or what kind of position should we take? And giving it, you know, a bit tabloid, uh, you, could, you could say, as, as we already seen, that Norway has, has a great experience from EVs. And we are in a position now where we, as, as Jürgen told, uh, showed us, are uh, actually in a position where we are starting to recycle a lot of batteries from, from, uh, from uh, the EVs, uh, including, of course, that we have a lot of um, experience from, from, from uh, IV, IVs over some period of time. And on the other side, we have Sweden, who are kind of, uh, I would say, the industrial partner in, in the Nordics uh, on a very tabloid um, uh, view. Of course, and then already we have talked about uh, Finland, who has a lot of raw materials and have these lithium mines and still have an operating mine. But as also we saw from, I think it was Jonna or, or Marco, I'm not quite sure, it's much more diversified than that, than this. This is the picture uh, uh, given to us by, by uh, Business Sweden, showing how, you know, the battery chain uh, in the Nordic can be built and we also see that there is a lot of you know cooperation opportunities in in this chain which is really great um building on some of the strengths uh, in the different uh, uh, countries so so i think what from my perspective what i've heard today and what i've also seen is that there is a lot of areas where we need to cooperate and i think we need also to kind of strengthen what is uh, the Nordic, uh, I would say, sales pitch uh, when it comes to positioning uh, the, the Nordic uh, battery belt. So looking at this, this actually shows us the, the great opportunity for cooperation. What are the challenges ahead of us? Um, we have already seen that uh, the picture that there's a lot of other initiatives going on. So we are definitely in a position where we are in great, uh, um, there is a lot of competition in, in Europe. So we need to find out how are we going to position ourselves and how are we going to do that together? And how can pl clusters play a role in this? So then looking at the challenges ahead of us, we need, in order to, to be able, both from the European side, but also from the Nordic side, we need to speed up the development. And speeding up the development, I think Peter has shown us that this is, this is not only about you know, research and, and development in the battery um, area, it's also about building new societies. It's also about giving permissions to where to build and, and getting really people to, to, to work in this uh, area. It's not just the businesses that need to, to speed up. It's also all the surrounding uh, environment. I loved your pyramid with all the different things that needed to kind of function in order, to us, in order for us to speed up this development. And we need, as, a, as, a, as the Nordics, to strengthen our market position uh, listening to you today and also listening to, to our politicians here in Norway, I see that the, the
the Nordic battery uh, belt is all about the green transition. It's all about building batteries in a more greener way. And we need to get out there and really position uh, the Nordic battery belt and our uh, ability to build these batteries and recycle these batteries um, in an even better way than what is done today. And I also think this is this building this market position is something that we need to cooperate uh, about. We cannot, it's not one single company that can do that in Norway. It's not one single company that could do that in, in Sweden or in Finland. We will be much stronger if we do this together. That's my opinion. And I, and I think I've heard a lot of others say the same thing today. One of the other things that I also mentioned when we talk about the battery chain and, and uh, operating the battery chain is, is competence. Uh, it's both, both building competence and attractive com attracting competence. And I also think that there's a very, uh, I would say, a very uh, difficult picture again, because it's, it's not one university that can do this, and it's not enough uh, just uh, getting the university to build this new competence. We need to make societies where these highly educated people would like to live and like to, to, to create a families and, and actually build a life, which I think Peter also gave us a very good um, uh, picture of how they do this in Skeftalor, which is really, really interesting. Uh, and of, we have also talked, I think, at least touched upon it um, as one of the main challenges moving forward is getting the critical components. I think some of the answer to the critical components is coming from recycle, but also being able to attract, you know, all the different parts that needs to be uh, within a battery before it's it's finally operating. And I think cooperating as an as a as a Nordics in in attracting also components and and building raw materials is is really really important in order for us to succeed. And the last one, I, I, we have also touched upon that uh, from the other um, uh, from the other re speakers today, but also this need for money. Uh, we need to attract foreign direct investment to the Nordics in order to make this happen. As you know, Freyr uh, decided to to go uh, public on the on the New York Stock Exchange in order to build sufficient funding, and they are still not. Um, reaching their goal for, for what they actually need. So there's a lot of money uh, that also private money that needs to put into be put into this. So this is some of the, the challenges that I see or uh, moving forward, building you know European uh, battery industry and also building the Nordic battery uh, industry. And I think in one way, if you look at the challenges, the need for clusters kind of speaks for itself. Because I think that the clusters will be a perfect platform or is a perfect platform, both when you look at the local, um, the local challenges. Uh, Peter, when you talked about how the municipality needs to kind of um, find their way and working together with not only the businesses, but you know, the universities, the schools, everything needs to kind of work together. And, and this is what the clusters are all about. So I, I also see that in Muirana in Norway, we have, a, we have a cluster working with both the municipalities, the commercial, the commerce uh, agencies, uh, the, the, the businesses, everybody trying to build this platform, uh, gathering people to make, make this transition work, to, to, to speed up the development in a good way. And also looking at how can we not only build new competence, but also transform the competence that is within the industry today in order to make them more able to take the new jobs in the battery industry. So I think in all these areas, if you just take the local perspective, clusters played a, a, an important role. And also when we start looking at, you know, Nordic, and, and strengthen our market position. Building these, as, as uh, Matthias said uh, initially, how can we uh, build uh, a picture of a good logistics in the Nordic? How can we 
show how the Nordic is very, very good position in, in recycling um, the batteries. These are areas where we think we, we actually need to work together. And clusters is a very good place to start this work. Uh, we can start uh, today because we have lots of clusters in Norway working with batteries, and I, I definitely think this, that that is the same in in in, uh, in Sweden and in 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 Finland as well. And these clusters can then you know take uh, up uh, the tasks of you know both speeding up the development, taking tasks in strengthening the market position, taking so, uh, tasks in, in start building the competence, uh, attracting the, the critical components. And, and also we see in Norway that when we are working with foreign direct investment, we use the clusters a lot because the foreign direct investors, they don't want to um, invest in just the business. They want to invest in the ecosystem that is surrounding the business. See that this is an ecosystem where, where the, 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 the investment they do have, a, have an environment where it can thrive and grow. And clusters, uh, we use clusters as, as a, a very good example of, of uh, how, how businesses are part of an ecosystem in order to do that. So, and I also wanted to say that there's a lot of thing going on already. Uh, there's a we have seen many of these uh, these logos already, and there's a lot of things going on. And I, one of the things that I would also like to emphasize is that when you are working with batteries, either in in Finland or Sweden, we sh we we should all sometimes jump on to some of the uh, activities that are already there, because there are a lot of initiatives going on. This is just one example. For instance, the Nordic Battery Thursdays, which has gone, gone on for a while. And this is part of, of, uh, of the European battery industry um, uh, that is, is now building up. And, and I, I think um, connecting uh, you know, the initiatives that will start, uh, hopefully from, as a result of, of what we have, have been doing today, to what is already going on is something that is, uh, is also, I think, very important. What we have also done in, in, in Norway, sorry, that was wrong. What we have also done in Norway to strengthen this is that we have, we have been starting, you know, also different uh, pro uh, projects in Norway. One of them uh, is, of course, that we have joined the Battery Thursday. Another one is that we have also started working on what kind of competence do we actually need in order to to um, to uh, build a, a, a viable and, and and growing battery industry, and also we have also selected one cluster in Norway to be kind of the national coordinating center for the battery industry. There's a lot of battery initiatives going on all over Norway, but we need a, a, a central partner that can actually coordinate all the initiatives and and try to build what is, is more or less the, the, the Norwegian um, value chain. And this value chain also needs to connect to the Nordic value chain. So one of the things that are within the, the I, I would say the, the, the mandate of this uh, national uh, coordination uh, from Ada Kling, the Ada cluster is actually to also work towards the Nordic uh, in order to, again, solve these issues which are the most important issues in order for us to be, you know, part of this uh, European battery um, industry adventure, which it can turn out to be. So that was my last uh, last uh, slide, and I I really encourage um, all of you who are listening today to to uh, you know uh, start working on these challenges. Uh, in order to build, in order for us to build a Nordic battery belt together, which, because we need to cooperate. Thank you so much, Christian. It was also very go good summarizing of our, all our speakers today. Uh, one question about these Nordic battery Thursdays, are those open for everybody? 
Yes, they are. They are open for everybody. So it's something that everybody can can listen into. I know there are there are, there are no. Um, I, I think they are, are reaching the last one, but they are also planning to do new ones in in uh, next year, uh, early spring next year. So so this is this is definitely an initiative that uh, people can listen into. Very good. Thank you. Uh, now it's still possible to ask questions or comment something or discuss uh, by raising hand or writing, uh, writing to chat. So please, if you have uh, some questions to Christian or some of uh, our other speakers, feel free to ask. Uh, and also if our speakers uh, have something to ask or comment to each other, so that's also possible. Uh, there is one question from the chat. Could you give more examples for the com uh, competencies you were talking about? I guess that that's probably for me. <laughs> I would get. Yeah. I'm 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 definitely not able to go down to to uh, to to the specific competencies that we're talking about. But but I I think that the competencies are. One of the things that really struck me when I was listening to all the different uh, speakers today is what kind of puzzle this really is uh, in order to, you know, you need, you need logistics, you need people who can recycle, you need, of course, the deep tech battery um, uh, engineers, uh, you need so many pieces in order to make this uh, work because there are there are it's almost endless <laughs> in the the kind of competence that we need to build and I um, Matthias also showed us a very good example on how we need to build you know uh, competence within logistics um, I think are we going to be competitive uh, b building a, a battery chain that is going to de deliver to for instance the European automotive industry we need to be you know sharp um in in the logistic uh, department so so there's so many different competences that actually needs to be built in order to make this uh, fly yes and you got thank you as well thank you uh, now the time is almost noon uh but what an inspiring morning we have had. Through this event, event uh, we wanted to offer an opportunity for everyone to get involved. Uh, we are seeing now fascinating industry being shaped. These huge investments will, will in the early stage not only require efforts in building new infrastructure, but also new logistics solutions. In the next phase, this new ecosystem will require a huge amount of workforce, like we heard already, a new way of working together across different industries and between companies and clusters. Not any kind of borders should be in our way. Uh, sustainability is a huge uh, advantage in Nordic can offer to the whole world. And sustainability can be traced throughout uh, to uh, the whole battery value chain from the minerals, goods like electricity, water, uh, to complete products and logistics of those, and also reuse of uh, batteries. Uh, Nordic Battery Belt is building to be one of a kind, surely. Uh, we together, Finland, Sweden and Norway can lead the way of sustainable, sustainable battery production in the world. Game changing new sustainable and clean technologies are also key to Europe's future, including in its ability to, to continue to be a global economy and global actor. With these words, I want to thank all of you for being with us uh, this morning. I wish all you an inspiring week. And don't forget uh, the matchmaking sessions, uh, which will be started uh, after one hour. So have a nice afternoon and goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thanks. 
Thanks. Goodbye.